a retired homicide detective. I've interviewed thousands of people, from serial killers to ministers. Welcome to the interview room. Welcome, everybody, to the interview room this wonderful Sunday evening. We hope you're doing well. So grateful that each and every one of you are here with us tonight. Uh, we want to thank all of our subs, our members, and, of course, our Patreon members. Uh, without you, a huge thank you. Uh, we could not do this work uh, or bring these special guests on. Uh, the greatest guest, guest in uh, YouTube, if you ask me. A uh, huge thank you to our mods, as always, Miss Sophia, our team lead, uh, Maui Girl, Mimi J2, and Tricia M. What great ladies and a fantastic job that they do for us, keeping our uh, chat room classy and, of course, uh, keeping us all on the straight and narrow. Uh, tonight, we're going to talk about a very sensitive uh, topic again, uh, the University of Idaho students, uh, Kaylee, Maddie, Zana, and uh, Ethan. Uh, but this is going to be an approach uh, from the forensic science aspect of things. And tonight's my special guest and my friend, my colleague, um, is uh, she's a recognized forensic scientist uh, by the name of Karen Elliott. Uh, and you can find her uh, full bio at the Cold Case Foundation, but you can also find her bio below uh, that we will attach. Karen is a certified latent print ex, uh, examiner. Uh, she has over 23 years experience as a forensic scientist and expertise in quality assurance, uh, friction ridge analysis, crime scene, and blood stain pattern analysis. She is the real deal, trust me. Uh, she is a trainer uh, in crime scene, blood stain pattern analysis, and latent prints. And she also uh, was formerly at the Utah Bureau uh, forensic science, and she was a supervisor there of ID impressions, evidence, and had overseen many, many crime scenes in her uh, um, just exemplary career. She's won numerous industry awards for her work. Uh, she's very humble, and her resume, in my opinion, uh, could go on and on, on and on, but she won't talk about it. I will, and I would encourage you to get over and take a look at her full resume. You will be impressed. Uh, today, she does private consulting uh, in forensic uh, analysis for law enforcement, forensic labs, and of course, attorneys. So if you need her, uh, you can see that uh, you can find her through the Cold Case Foundation or Elliott Consultant uh, LLC. And uh, this is Karen Elliott. She is not my Karen. Ha ha. In fact, Miss Karen Elliott is married to her best friend, Jim, and they have been married well over 41 years. They have two beautiful daughters. And how many grandchildren now, Karen? Four. Four. Three girls and a boy. Yeah. Three girls and a boy. Uh, and uh, so let's welcome Karen to our program tonight. Welcome, Karen. Thank you. <laughs> And you are in for a treat, guys and gals. She, uh, she's going to hang around for questions and make sure we, we, we really um, let her, you know, ask her some really good questions because she'll, <laughs> she'll, she'll answer them for her. And plus, she's a South Carolina girl. Went, uh, she went to school in South Carolina and raised her family there. And now she's out there in, in the West. 
So the West took her for a little while, but the her heart is a Carolina girl. Yeah. Uh, so, okay, Karen, tonight, this is really, as you and I just talked, you know, offline before we came live, uh, this is a very sensitive subject that you and I both, you know, always, you know, we take care to make sure that we're respectful, um, you know, to the families and, you know, specifically the victims here. But I, I want tonight, I want to really get into, you know, talking about some of the mechanics of, let's say, you know, your team, uh, and you've had many of them, and you've you've led many of them, and you and you teach them even today. Let's say your team got that phone call. Okay? And the obvious, you and I both know, the investigative team would circle up, uh, you, the CSI team would show up, you'd be head of, you'd be leading that. And walk us through from your experience of what takes place in relationship to you going on scene and how you would unpack this particular crime scene that day. Well, first of all, it's going to be very important to make sure you, that you have enough people. And with a crime scene this large and this involved, you're going to need um, a, a different specializations of crime scene people. And so, you know, what, what it would require is for your lead person to go through, meet with your lead investigator. Um, you're going to walk through the crime scene. Um, typically, you will, you will wait until uh, inviting your other crime scene analysts in until after you have made the walk through with the investigators. Um, the reason we do that is that we just want to make sure that we have everybody in the right place. Uh, first of all, we're going to examine, since this crime scene was involved externally and internally, you're going to want to um, rope it off pretty large to start with. And you can see in this picture that, that you have up on the screen, there are many cars there as well as uh, one of the um, officers. Um, typically what you wanna do is just tape off a large area that you might consider your crime scene. And you want to start large so that you can kind of work inward. And so what would happen is that you would rope off an area and then have very few people to enter the crime scene at the time. Your lead crime scene person would go in first with your lead investigator or the assigned investigator. Um, what I would typically do in a situation like this is to maybe walk around the um, perimeter of the crime scene to just make sure to see what we have. In this picture, you actually see snow. And to my knowledge, I believe this was the, the crimes happened before the snow had fallen. And so um, the, the photos that I've actually seen look like the investigators were there prior to the snowfall. Uh, you can see all of the tracks there. Those are kinds of things that we want to try to avoid. We do not want that many tracks to be there because if there's a possibility that the perpetrator could have left shoe impressions, that's very important. So you want to limit the number going in first. And so what you want to do is kind of do a perimeter search. Um, you want to try to find out where the point of entry was. Obviously, if, you, if you're if you out on the perimeter and you see footwear impressions or if you see any blood stains and all of that, you, you'll want to mark those to make sure that those are taken care of pretty quickly because if it starts to snow again or starts to rain, all of that is very transient evidence. You want to make sure and take care of that first. Or okay, at least so for let's, let's talk about that for a second. I didn't mean to interrupt. That's okay, a, you're you've fine. Got some, no, no, you've got some great thoughts going on here. Uh, break down what transient evidence is. Okay, transient evidence is, are, are, is evidence that can be uh, destroyed or moved or um, blown away, let's say, in a windstorm or maybe if the... If the snow comes down more, it can mess up a footwear impression. And you want to make sure that those kinds of things that could be destroyed by the elements 
or could be destroyed by other people walking through, you want to make sure that you take care of that evidence first. Um, many times, say if it's a footwear impression that looks like it might be the perpetrators, you might want to even cover it if you think that maybe there's an even more snow coming or more rain coming. Those are things that could be destroyed in the event that you had um, some kind of a natural, uh, not you know, rainfall, or if if more people entered the scene and potentially could mess up a footwear or a tire track impression. So you've got in this particular case, we can obviously see, you know, what appears to be you know foot prints or something mm -hmm. uh, in right. the snow. And this was, you know, this was taken 10 days after the crime scene. So we know when the uh, first team got there, they started processing, uh, it appeared from the outside in. Tell us why that is significant in a case like this. Of course. First of all, you want to try to make your perimeter. You see the crime scene tape there. You're going to develop a perimeter. Um, that perimeter can start out wide. And then as you um, find evidence or lack of evidence, you start to close the per crime scene inward. Um, on occasion, you may have to make it larger, the crime scene larger, if you find additional evidence. But in this particular area, they they were called in, all of these cars were present with the exception of perhaps the police car, obviously. And so they wanted to um, secure that area before anyone else went in there and destroyed the evidence. I, my understanding is it was not snowing that night, but mm -hmm. you want to make sure that if it is snowing, that you take care of any kind of a transitory type evidence that could be destroyed if anybody else were to come into the scene. Yeah, so in theory, that parking lot, that backyard, that si those side yards, and maybe even a little bit further out, depending on what initially is known, is is a crime scene, right? So you, go ahead. You, yeah, you can start large and then go smaller if you need to, or either you can, oftentimes you, um, Sometimes you, you can go larger. Um, it just depends on where your evidence takes you. But you typically will cordon off an area within crime scene tape, and that's where you'll start. And you want to include as much as you can to start off because you don't want to miss any evidence. And so that's the reason you start. it starts large and then becomes smaller. Got it. Sometimes it can grow the other way, but typically you start large and go smaller. Got it. The um, so walk us through the steps now. Photography, uh, maybe a faro uh, of some sort. Can you break the those uh, pieces of the puzzle down for everybody? Sure. When the crime scene unit typically arrives at a scene, you will you will usually have a lead investigator, and they will meet with your lead officer, perhaps a detective or maybe the first responding officer, uh, you will, the lead investigator will talk to your lead forensic person or your crime scene person, and they will kind of give them an idea of what they have found so far. Hopefully there's not been a whole lot of officers involved inside of that perimeter because the more people you have involved going in, the more you have to eliminate once you start your crime scene analysis. So um, what would happen is typically you would have a responding officer or a lead investigator to meet with the lead forensic or crime scene person, and they will kind of walk through and tell them what has happened here. Um, during that whole time, I like to have my um, group taking overall photos, photos of the neighborhood, photos of any kind of, of of roads in and out, any kind of escape routes, any kind of entry routes. And so those kinds of things are very important to look at the external area first and then work yourself inward. Okay. And you have, looks like, obviously, these are the victim's vehicles, uh, potential. Those look like yeah, I believe those are the victim's vehicles. I'm not sure about the one in the the black car in the front. Do you know which one that was? The uh, one right here, it looks like a four-wheeler. 
I I don't know. I okay. I'm assuming it was an investigator's car behind the okay. tape. That yeah. I think the Jeep, the uh, the Chevy, the Range Rover, and then of course the other blue car at the other end are potentially right. connected to the to the house. But you know, there's a, there was there's been a couple of questions I've seen floating around uh, about why didn't they take the the victim's cars right away? You know, were they processed right away? You 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 would not process these cars at that location, would would your team? Probably not. You would probably transport them to a sally port, which is kind of like a garage at a police station or a crime lab, so that you could get them out of the elements. You want to make sure that they don't get extra snow on them, that there's not any potential damage to any kind of transient type evidence that might be on them. Um, the, the vehicles may not even be involved in the case at all, other than they are just the maybe the victim's vehicles. But you want to leave them there at first to make sure that there's no potential evidence being left behind. Okay. And once those vehicles were photographed, uh, then typically they would be removed uh, once the entire exterior of the scene is photographed and documented correctly. Is that what that be? Accurate? Correct. Um, right. It is always best to transport a vehicle to a sally port, which is basically a garage at the police station or a crime lab. And it's just a very, um, it's a very pristine area that's clean. It's an area so that you can uh, process the vehicles without any kind of weather bothering you or uh, you know, the public eye, and that's always interesting too. So you want to, tr if, if possible, you want to transfer those cars. Um, sometimes we do process them at the scene, but being in this particular situation where you've got snow and potential of snow um, falling again or rain, you want to tr probably transport those if it looks like the weather is going to be bad or if you feel like there's any potential evidence on the outside of the vehicle, particularly. Got it. Got it. And uh, for so everybody knows, uh, Sally Port is a, a covered, controlled environment. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is great. They love they uh, folks love it, and you have you have so much information. And it just you've been doing it for so long. It just is just there, and uh, I I get it, and I know a lot of our you know true crimers get it, but yeah. I just sometimes like to clarify. Okay, so now that you're you're looking at that building, you're you're looking at the doors, the windows, the uh, the the ground. What are you looking for? A multitude of information. You want to look at the crime scene first, and you're going to photograph everything from every direction in a pristine manner. Um, you want to make sure that you cordon the area off with crime scene tape. And you're going to start larger than smaller. You're going to start large so that you can start to grow into a, a smaller area as you get, get the processing done. Um, sometimes crime scene vehicles or police vehicles will be inside the tape, the crime scene tape. Um, most of the time, it's best not to include the police vehicles because sometimes they can mess up any kind of like tire track uh, information. You can see there in this picture where you have some looks like footwear impressions and potentially some tire tracks. We don't know right now, if, and I don't know um, about this particular picture, but it looks like um, that might one of those tire tracks could be from that police vehicle. So th those are kinds of things that you um, you can take care of, pr you might want to photograph all of that information prior to taking a police vehicle into the crime scene tape. And the, the obviously the uh, forensics teams, you guys are in charge of this, of this exterior. And, and I know I can tell you how many times I've been yelled at, you know, hey, you know, don't go over there. And right. What we try to do is cordon off an area of crime scene tape so that people will know they're they're looking at it and realizing that and they usually say caution, do not enter or crime scene tape, do not enter or crime scene, do not enter. So those are the areas that we want to make sure that they are pristine. So 
Sometimes the crime scene take can grow outward, depending on if we find evidence outside of that cordoned off area. Sometimes it can grow inward as we finish our investigation on the outside. You want to take as many photos, you want to do as much investigation on the outside, take as many photographs as you can on the outside before moving inward. Okay, um, so you've got these doors and windows. Uh, what are you what are you looking for and what um, you know, are you using red WAP or what are you guys doing? It, it depends on the laboratory. Um, people use different uh, reagents for different things. Um, what you see here is you, you do see that there's a police vehicle and it looks like it is in, in the crime scene, um, behind the crime scene tape. Um, oftentimes that doesn't happen until well into the investigation to try to keep crime scene uh, units outside of the tape for as long as possible because you don't want to do anything that could potentially damage any kind of transitory evidence and that's basically evidence that can change over time uh, for example you can see some footwear impressions maybe in this snow well snow will melt so you want to take care of any kind of what we call transitory evidence first so that you don't damage anything walking into the actual scene. So you want to photograph it. You may have to have a certain number of investigators take charge of that particular area. And then maybe you find another route in order to get into the house. And some of these footwear impressions may be the result of, say, ambulance or medical um, because they've already been there obviously, because they found the victims. And so you have to eliminate them as well. So you want to cordon off an area and then work inward. Okay. And uh, Lori, Lori Matthews says cross-contamination. Hey, can you explain what that um, terminology is? Okay. Cross-contamination is basically um, when you have uh, potential evidence on you and you bring it into another area. And so you don't want to have evidence that could potentially lead from one area into the crime scene. That could that could contaminate your cr crime scene. In addition, cross-contamination can occur outwardly, meaning that if you were to um, get blood or, or some kind of um, evidence on your footwear, then maybe, or, or on your clothing, your, your um, protective clothing, you could actually take it outside. So it's better to just, uh, once you get into your protective gear, that you stay inside the crime scene until it's completely processed. Interesting. Okay, so now you're um, at the windows. There looks like they were taking photographs and it looks like they were dusting uh, the windows in the back. Uh, tell us about that process. Okay, I don't see that photograph. Is that? Do you have that photograph? I let me. Well, I only ha I only have the one with the tire impressions externally, but there is one okay. where th they are at a back window and looks like there's four or five people looking at um, the window in of itself. And my impression was they're looking for a point of entry and yeah, the back obviously door that's very possible that they could be looking for a point of entry if, and particularly if there's some footwear impressions leading into that point of entry um that that is very important we want to make sure that we capture that those footwear impressions or any other kind of evidence that pot could potentially be damaged if it's not collected pretty quick. Snow is very transient, so it can melt. So you want to make sure that you collect those kinds of transient items very, very quickly so that they're not destroyed by your investigators getting in there. They're not destroyed by weather. They're not destroyed by wind. So you wanna to try to get that evidence done pretty quickly. Okay, so um, there is always, room for um you know people to come into this before the 911 call comes in uh you know there's a significant delay that the authorities 
uh, at this point are unable to, you know, answer what that means. You know, we don't know yet. The public doesn't know. Um, there is in the affidavit one of the other roommates who said they were in a, you know, a, basically a frozen phase. Uh, and so we don't know what that means in totality. So there's information that possibly other individuals came into this crime scene uh, before the 911 call went down. And if so, walk us through why it would be important to identify who those individuals are and then what would you guys do uh, from a forensic scientist and CSI team perspective with those individuals? Uh, the wind individuals that have entered the crime scene prior to it being a cordon off, is that what you're saying? Yes, before law enforcement potentially even got there. Okay, what we typically want to do is try to get those individuals to, to hang out. We want, might want to get footwear impressions of their shoes to just make sure that, okay, this particular person, we can identify their shoe to a foot track that we might find in the snow or maybe something in the house. Uh, you want to make sure that you get all of their personal information um, and, and find out where they can be reached. Um, any kind of evidence that could be transitory, you want to make sure that that's tackled first. And so um, you just want to make sure that anyone that is um, at the scene or a part of the scene has um, all of their information taken before they're let before they're dismissed. Yeah, and so if these individuals weren't identified, that uh, puts you guys, when you're collecting evidence, uh, it puts you in a position to identify potentially uh, maybe some of that cross-contamination, and that could be done through, you know, DNA and, and a variety of other stuff, uh, ultimately. And those people, you know, in my experience, if they had not come forward uh, and identified themselves, and they do find evidence that they were in that house. Uh, as as Ricky used to say, Lucy, you have some explaining to do. And uh, so the, this, it's still open for interpretation uh, in relationship to an ongoing investigation at this point, even to this day, even though somebody's in custody. Okay, Correct. so you're in, you're at that door frame. Now, and those of you who are just joining with us, um, this is my colleague, uh, forensic scientist, Karen Elliott. Uh, she's done hundreds and hundreds of these things, and I've I've worked with her on other cases. Uh, remember, we did the guy uh, over in, I think it was Siberia uh, in the snow. Did we, <laughs> I don't think I was part of that one. You weren't part of that one? Okay. I don't think I was a part of that one. <laughs> I thought you were. I did, uh, anyway, the... Uh, She's done uh, so much, and she's uh, a world. She's an expert. She's testified many times as an expert. Okay, you're at the door. Walk us through it. What are you looking for? Are, are you talking about the front door where I'm getting ready to go in? Yes, ma'am. Okay. First of all, I'm going to look around the house first. Okay. That uh, or or the apartment or whatever is there. You're going to document as much of the evidence on the outside prior to entry. And the reason for that is, especially in um, areas that get snow or a lot of rain, you, the evidence is very transitory. It's going to blow away or melt as in the snow. And footwear impressions outside can be very important in the snow. So you want to, to make sure that you capture any of those types of evidence, evidence that can be melted. It's very transitory. It can move around. Snow can blow back on top of it. You want to make sure that you can capture that first. So you're going to pick an area to enter the scene. You got, you're going to have a group of people on the outside taking care of documenting tire and footwear. You're going to make sure that you document all of that first. Once you get into the scene, you're going to have another group that's going in. They're going to make sure that they are photographing the entire scene all the way. <clears throat> and so, so they're um, 
that once you are into the scene um, and you're going to have all of your protective gear on, you're going to have booties and maybe even Tyvek suits, depending on the type of evidence it is, uh, you're, you're going to make sure that the forensic scientist or crime scene investigator must be protected just as much because there are so many um, contamination issues that we have to be aware of. So you're going to make sure that you're number one, you're going to be dressed in full protective gear. You're going to go into the scene. You're going to be photographing as you go. You're going to be photographing each of the rooms in an overall position. And then you're going to start photographing uh, smaller details. Um, and, and as you're doing this, you're going through and you're, you're documenting as much information, you're writing it down, you're documenting it on video, you potentially um, can document um, with, a, with evidence called a ferro scan, which is a three-dimensional type of, of um, evidence collection. Um, and, and you're photo photographing and sketching everything as you go. And you're going to work um, forward to uh, into your crime scene. And so um, you're protecting all of the evidence potentially as you go. Okay, and why is that significant for such a slow methodical approach into processing the scene? Well, number one, you're, you, you, you just really can't afford not to, I mean, you can't afford to miss anything. And, and certainly there is no perfect crime scene. But what we try to do is address the overall issue first. We want to get overall photographs. And then we start to narrow it down and go to uh, mid-range photographs. And then we go to the close-up photographs. When you first walk in, you're going to be looking at the overall picture. Um, you may have someone to take, maybe your lead investigator is going to go in. They're going to be fully in protective gear, full, fully clothed. You're going to have your booties on, and you're going to start looking overall at the scene. You're going to work yourself in into the scene, and as you go through, you're photographing, looking for potential evidence. You may even be putting down... Uh, little marker, tent markers to um, identify evidence that you may find along the way. And so all of that is very, very methodical. You're going to have someone who is actually taking notes, someone who's documenting all of the evidence. Sometime video is done at a scene. Um, and so you just want to make sure that nothing is being missed and you're going to work yourself into the scene. And once you find um, in this particular situation, um, the, the um, investigators were walking into um, the scene and they were, you know, they were documenting everything outside first and then they walked inside and they're documenting as they're going. It's very, very methodical. Um, a lot of, a lot of uh, notes taken, a lot of photographing, a lot of videotaping. And in this particular situation, obviously, you have three stories. And you would expect, you know, the first responders, the, the patrol guys, when they get there, uh, they're going to clear the house for officer safety, as well as try to identify any obvious evidence that's sticking right. out. Mm -hmm. And they're going to go to the top to the bottom. And... Typically, you, that officer is going to be very conscious of, you know, movement within inside of that house because in this particular situation, and I want to be very sensitive to everybody, uh, specifically uh, the victims here, this is a very, very bloody crime scene. Correct. And the reason, you know, Karen is on here tonight because, in my opinion, um, you know, she's one of the best, if not the best in the country on blood stain pattern analysis. <laughs> well, I mean, you've been there, done that. And you're kind, but thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. But um, anyway, long story short, um, explain why it's significantly important for everybody coming into that scenario to listen to you if you were in that 
environment, why would it be significantly important to recognize uh, what they're seeing there? Oh, you mean after we have found the bodies? Is that what you're saying? Correct. Okay. First of all, it's very important that everybody wears protective gear. Um, and you're going to limit the number of crime scene people into the into the scene to start with, because the more crime scene people you have, the more chance of cross contamination, loss of evidence. And so you're going to, to pick your your teams and you're going to make sure that they um, they may have certain specializations. And so, you, you know, you may have some people that are your footwear entire analysts. And so what you would do, and, and particularly in this photo that you see here, you may want to make sure that the footwear tire people get there pretty quickly so that because all that evidence is, like I mentioned, very transitory. Um, you get a good wind and some of that some of that's damaged. If the snow melts, then there's damage to some of that external snow there, footwear and tire impressions that can be found in the snow. So you want to do all the photography and stuff on the outside and then work yourself in because like i said a lot of the stuff on the outside is very transitory so when you go on the inside you're starting to look from the inside and um, from the outside in and you're looking for any potential evidence as you go uh you you don't want to just willy-nilly go through the scene you may step on a casing that's very important you may uh kick a casing that's very important. You may step on blood stains that are very important to our analysis. So it's very methodical who you send in um, and how you attack that particular crime scene. And where would you start? Bottom, at the bottom and work your way up or at the top and work your way down? This is, I think, important for people to understand as well. Okay, so you mean from the top of the, the out? from the inside of the building yeah, from the door would okay. you go to the top and then work your way down or would you start in the top bottom and work your way up you know i i don't know that that would be that important you're wanting to what you're going to do is you're going to take do a walk through you're going to have a lead investigator who is going to walk through the scene first now they're going to have on protective gear they're going to have on their booties they're going to have on a, any kind of protective eyewear they may have on protective clothing and and particularly if there's blood stain or biological uh, fluids there because some of those can be very dangerous as we know and so we want to make sure that our our investigators are protected and so they may have on their uh, protective clothing and the protective glasses and so they'll walk your your leader will walk through the crime scene um, they will go from room to room and then as they go they are making notes they're documenting information you probably have a photographer uh, slow uh, you know almost right after that to make sure that um, that they're getting everything in a pristine condition um, we've been in scenes where uh, the in, the lead investigator will walk in and they don't see a shell casing. They could accidentally kick that shell casing. We want to make sure we're not doing that. So we're very methodical. We take care, pay close attention to any kind of potential transient type evidence that could be lost um, just by walking through the scene. And so you'll you walk through the scene, you'll uh, walk from the outside in and as you go there's tons of documentation being done there's video being done you may even have what they call a pharaoh scan that will be done shortly um, into the investigation to kind of um, map out the entire room or in the entire area pharaoh scans are used a lot in blood stain analysis and evidence um, uh, seeking evidence as well and so those are the kinds of things that we look for initially and we want to make sure that the lead person can do an overall look at the scene and then start to choose their specializations people that might be specialized in a particular area safe footwear and tire analysis you're going to have those people out looking in the snow for any kind of potential evidence that could be lost if the sun comes out 
or if the rain starts. So uh, lots of times we have to make sure that those people are notified pretty quickly and that they start to take care of their evidence soon because we don't want any kind of a transitory evidence to be lost. Okay, so in this particular situation where you're dealing with the amount of uh, potential blood uh, in the scene of it itself, help uh, the audience understand the steps necessary uh, to take. And, and, and I'm going to approach this from, uh, you know, an investigative approach, right? From I'm the case agent. I've walked in there with you. We've identified certain things. You see things and you say, okay, A, B, C, and D, let's go this way. And we go that way. Photographs are being taken. Uh, maybe body camera, you know, depending with today's technology. But once all of those pieces of the puzzle, i.e. the lead case agent sees that crime scene, he sees the victims, he sees what's going on in those rooms, um, that really from an investigative aspect, now my job is to pull back and Correct. your job is to push forward. Okay? Correct. So help us, uh, help the public understand that even though uh, these scenes are dynamic. They're not, once all of the cast off and the, a lot of the stuff is identified, uh, break that down what you now really get into the nitty gritty. And let me show you some of the, I've got one photograph. And by the way, this is not from, uh, for the record, right, guys and gals uh, and everybody in chat. This is not the scene of this residence. Again, this is not the scene at this residence. It is a, uh, a different scene. So I just want the one on the left where um, this was another murder I just pulled off of uh, the internet. And the one on the right is outside of the scene earlier where it looks like they're processing. Um, does that look like they're doing tire it, it looks like tire from what I can tell because they're measuring a, it looks like a tire track. Yeah. Uh, the one on the left though, you see, we see a grid uh, and, and a um, evidence marker. Right. Uh, so let's, let's walk through. We've, we now know the type of weapon. Okay. It's a K bar type of knife. Correct. And we have four victims and we don't know the sequence of the attack. Uh, there's a lot of theories out there, but until the authorities release that information, I don't want to, you know, go there yet. Correct. But what type of um, things, uh, br break down the different types of um, shapes and sizes and, and, you know, ideas in relationship to bloodstain pattern analysis. Okay, and, and there's a multitude of information uh, with bloodstain pattern analysis, but uh, I saw what you had there with your um, uh, kind of a grid system that you had, or, or mapping is what we call it, and that's where you take your measurements or your measuring tape, and you... Um, Put it alongside of a particular area where you find some blood stain and blood stains. Um, there, there may be within those blood stains. There may be certain patterns. There may be certain types of blood stains, like um, maybe some drips, maybe some arterial spurt. So all of those things are very, very important. So you go through and you map those out with the measuring devices that you see in that fo previous photograph, and then there's a methodical way to go through and document all of that other than photography. Photography is huge, but you can also document with scales and making sure that everything is documented so that you can go actually go back and re-enter that particular evidence in a particular area if need be. And so it's very methodical, it's very slow, but we wanna make sure that our measurements are identified. Um, and then once we have a, um, an area that has measurements of, of the entire area, then you can go through and actually 
take out pieces of evidence and mark those pieces of evidence. And, um, and, and sometimes it's blood stains, sometimes it's um, pieces of evidence, like a shell casing or something like that. So you'll just want to make sure that you cover all of that evidence so that they can actually go back and put it back into a grid system if they need to. Okay, and and in this kind of case, uh, talk about cast off. What is cast off? Okay, cast off is actually where blood accumulates on a weapon of choice. In this case, it was a K-bar knife. But a cast off can be any kind of a weapon that's used, perhaps uh, a bat, a hammer. Uh, you can even use the butt of a gun. Anything that's used in uh, causing bloodshed to a victim. And what happens is blood will accumulate on that particular weapon. And when the arm goes back into a particular um, motion, that blood is actually cast off and hits a surface. And that target surface comes up with a very distinguishable pattern. Sometimes with cast off, most of the times with cast off, it'll be a very linear type of a stain. Uh, the stains will start very circular or very um, more, more round in shape at the closer to the bloodletting. And as the arm is moved into kind of an art like pattern, you start to see the, the, the stains become very elongated. And so that's the cast off. It means that the blood is being cast off from a weapon. Okay, and and how can you determine velocity within that cast off stain? Okay, cast off. Um, most of the time, velocity is associated with the amount of force that is associated with a particular kind of weapon, and so you have what they call high velocity. High velocity is any kind of high force event. Um, things like gunshot wounds, uh, sometimes expirated blood can be kind of a high force misting looking event. Um, then there's kind of like a medium force event where blood is uh, uh, being subjected to a medium force like cast off. And then you can have what they call um, uh, low force events like a dripping situation. And so all of those have very distinguishable uh, looking patterns or very distinguishable looking drops. And so we take that information and we try to um, come up with some kind of a scenario uh, looking at those particular blood stains. Okay. And would they be able to determine the velocity how? Would that be a comparative analysis to the type of wounds you may see uh, on, a, on a victim? Um, most of your wounds that you're going to see um, on a victim are, are not determined by velocity. The blood spots that, they, that are left help you determine velocity. So um, typically when you have dripping, that's considered a low force event. Um, blood uh, that comes off of a weapon can sometimes be a medium force event. Anything that comes out of like a high force event, like a gun, those are called, um, they almost look like misty patterns. So they'll be more like an aerosol type of an event. Okay, so what, what would you, in your experience with knife, uh, type of scenes, what type of um, um, shapes and sizes would you expect to see uh, at a particular scene? I know, I know that's kind of an open-ended question, and it's kind of you know. it, it's okay because there there are a lot of different kinds of things that you might see. In using a knife, sometimes you will see very linear, what you call cast off patterns. And that's basically with the arc or the movement in the hand, the weapon is, or the blood is being cast off of a knife. And so those will be very linear patterns and the blood stains themselves may be very elliptical, 
and that depending on the surface that they're hitting, they may be very long. It depends on the surface. Um, you may have situations where um, in a knife situation, there could be dripping off of a knife. That's called a low force event. It just basically means that gravity is pulling the blood off of a knife. Um, you rarely see high force events involved with knives unless there is a, um, an area that has been breached like um, an airway. Sometimes you will find expirated blood that looks very, very much like um, uh, much like an aerosol event where there's blood inside the airways and they may be there coughed out. Sometimes you will see uh, arterial breaches. Arterial breaches are when an artery is cut or breached and there, because of the amount of force from the blood pumping through the body, you might get something called arterial spurt. And so that's a very distinguishable um, marking it, depending on the surface that it hits. If it hits the side of a wall, you may see more like a, a systolic type pattern that you might see on uh, a blood pressure kind of a tape or an EKG movement. So um, it depends on the type of uh, weapon that's used and it depends on um, the, the amount of force behind it. And so when you see these different shapes, for an example, and you and you, you know, a lot of folks don't quite understand that when you go into a crime scene and you see all this, you know, evil in front of us, right? That a lot of folks just concentrate on, you know, the coagulation, a, a large amount of coagulated blood. And and in this case, obviously it appeared that it looked like the external side of the house, you know, had maybe some uh, blood coming out of it. And, um, but that said, I don't, I don't want to focus on that with these kids, but what I, what I do want to focus on is really inside of the house where a lot of this rage and, and horror is taking place this the significance of understanding potentially how many strikes were made how would you determine that if you were in that room how many strikes were made to to the stab victim. the person particularly yeah, the okay strike. okay so what we use oftentimes is the linear cast off to determine how many uh stab wounds were or attempts were made. Oftentimes when someone is in a stabbing motion, they will gather the blood with the first stab and as they pull out of the, the um, body and there's blood that's accumulated, it will make a linear pattern. And so um, it'll, it may go across the maybe go across the ceiling, it may go across the wall, it may go across the floor. And so um, you can oftentimes know how many times a person was stabbed by the number of uh, linear patterns that you see, maybe across the wall or across the floor. Um, and so it, it's called cast off, and it's literally blood that has been cast off of a weapon. Yeah, it, and I, I think it's important for folks to understand that because that, if he's moving, if the suspect's moving or the victim is moving, mm -hmm. you could see those linear lines moving as well in various, exactly. in various different directions, correct? Correct. And you can tell, almost tell, how many times that they were stabbed. Uh, based on the amount, the linear lines that you might see, the linear patterns that you see in the room. The first one is obviously not going to um, cause it, but the second stab or the, the second time it's pulled out, you're going to have blood accumulated on the knife and it's going to cast off. That's what it's called. It's called a cast off pattern and it's going to cast blood off in a very angular motion. And um, it, you, uh, can see that there's, uh, you know, that is at least one, two strikes there. The first one is the, the blood in and then the blood out. So uh, explain why it's important for measurements. You see uh, sometimes folks see pictures 
on the internet, you know, where um, you guys have come in and you've put, you know, a measuring uh, numbers on one side and then, you know, numbers across the top. Uh, break that down for people. Why is that significant? Okay, we, we want to isolate um, the area in, and document the area in which the bloodletting occurred. And so what we will do is we will measure the, the put it, a measuring device. Lots of times it's like a type of tape that we measure or we'll, we'll run across, um, say for example, the, the top or the, uh, or the wall perhaps. And then you'll put another linear measurement down the side. What we want to do is to go through and measure each of these stains and each of the patterns that we see. Um, I'll get into that in a minute, but we want to try to duplicate as much of the scene as we can so that when we go to document it we'll be able to tell um, what kind of weapon perhaps made that or what kind of force com uh, made that particular pattern and um, all of that in accumulation we can sometimes tell uh, sometimes we can tell the type of weapon sometimes that we can tell um, whether or not it was just gravity taken over a particular blood source. And so that we document that very, very carefully and very methodically, and then document each different kind of pattern that you might have, you might see, because they're all caused from different events. Yeah, it's not, it may not be one fluid event. No. Okay. And if two individuals are sleeping or if they're in their room, um, what are some variances that could, um, you know, change the dynamics of that potential cast off, like a, like, you know, a, a blanket or a sheet or something like that? Explain that and then explain if a, if a edge weapon was utilized, uh, what that could potentially uh, look like. Okay. So lots of times, um, if you've got someone that's in the bed, let's just say that perhaps, if there's any kind of clothing or sheets or blankets that would be in between the weapon and the body, sometimes that weapon um, or the blood that's on the weapon can be pulled off by some of the clothing or pulled off and by some of the bedding. And so you may not get quite as much information on the cast off because you've got some interference there. You've got some blankets or some clothing that may cause some kind of interference. However, that information is valid too. We we look at we look at um, blankets on a bed. We look at the clothing that may that person may have been wearing. So even though we may not get the cast off um what you might necessarily get if you have clothing in the way, um, those those kinds of items are still very, very important to our analysis. Yeah, and all of those from an evidentiary uh, perspective, obviously everything in that room is collected. I mean, you would you would expect in a high profile situation like this that the mattresses are boxed. Uh, and collected. Uh, I mean, we've even taken wall. We've taken walls. Yeah. I mean, right? How many? How many times have you said, you know, what, we're just going to cut this all out, and it's going, and you guys can do a further analysis, even a deeper dive. Uh, thing. Correct. Now, and and you and prior to doing all that, you want to make sure that you photograph everything in place, in a pristine manner. First, you want to make sure that everything's photographed so that in the event that you need to put it all back in place at some point, you can, especially if you're taking it to a jury. Um, you want to make sure that you can actually even replicate the area if necessary to make sure that the jury can get a good uh, impression of what was going on in that room at that time. Yeah, interesting. Um, so now then, when you think about the type of weapon that we believe, uh, based on some of the media reports, based on some of the affidavits and information that's been presented, i.e. A, a sheath where DNA, uh, touch DNA was found on a snap, uh, 
on that sheath laying next to one of the victims. Um, uh, what is the significance uh, and the steps of collecting the DNA, you know, swabbing and the presumptive test and all of these other things? And then, you know, answer, you know, kind of go down that lane and then talk about cross contamination from, you know, one potential victim to the next utilizing uh, that knife as a as a mechanism to move it. Absolutely. And, and, and this is going to be difficult because you've got, um, you know, multiple victims. And so what you're going to look at, the first thing that you're going to do is to photograph, photograph, photograph. You want to make sure that you get pristine photographs and then you get, um, then, then you want to make sure that you get everything photographed in place. Uh, you want to make sure that you have, um, documented everything uh, in a sketch, perhaps. We do a lot of sketching. And then as, and you want to start outward and go in. You want to make sure that you're getting all the information uh, from outside the perimeter and then work your, work your way in, gathering as much evidence as you can as you go through. And you want to make sure that um, all of it's documented tinted then you photograph everything and then as as the as the crime scene progresses through you just make sure that you're putting markers on everything make sure that you're uh, getting all of the correct information blood stain analysis is interesting because you you must take care in documenting that um, because it can be so damaged if you're not careful. You have to make sure that you take your pristine photographs, which means the photographs with nothing that's uh, been interfered with. You have to make sure that's done first. Then you have to make sure that you're um, mapping it off, making sure that you can actually put it back into the location um, that, uh, that it was that it was found in. And so, you know, let's just say, for example, you find um, some blood stains that are 10 feet inside the room. You want to make sure that you measure the length and the width and you make sure that um, that you are measuring so that they can go back and put that blood stain right back in the place as it was. So that when you go to court, you may even be able to do kind of like a reconstruction and so that the, all the blood stains will be in the exact precise location that they were found at the crime scene. Very, very important that you do video and then do your sketch and make sure all your measurements are done exactly proper. So the different types of uh, wounds that you would you would see from a... Uh... Explain what an incision wound uh, would look like initially. I mean, outside of what we would see at the ME's office with the initial presentation, and of course, when the bodies were, when a body would have been cleaned up and that wounds, you know, potentially could okay. change. The yeah, an incised wound can be very, um, it can be different. You make, you can get nicks and cuts where the skin is pulled open and you can start to see the internal tissues. Oftentimes though, especially in brutal attacks like this one, you will actually cut through layers of skin. You will cut through the skin, then you can cut through the muscle, and then you will have gaping wounds. That K-bar knife is a large knife and it's, um, it, it's kind of got serrated edges on it. So it's not always going to be a clean cut. If um, it depends on how it's utilized as well, um, you know, sometimes the, the edges can be very um, clean, but because it does have some serration in it, um, there can be rough edges as well. Um, did that answer your question? Yeah, I mean, that, okay. and there's a well, you know, a lot of times folks, uh, because of the elasticity of the, the skin, a lot of people believe you know, you detectives and CSI folks, they get there and they go, oh, well, that's a, you know, whatever. Okay. Or that's this, that's this <clears throat> wrong. Okay. No, you will never ever. Right. We know. Uh, I, I can tell you how many, you know, gunfights I've been to in terms of watching, you know, seeing the victims 
And, you know, you, you get that one person who comes in and goes, oh, well, that's a, a 45 caliber, you know, blah, blah, blah. And you get to the ME's office and they scoop out a 22 bullet and drop it into the, the cup yeah. and you go, okay, hey, nice way to go, Sherlock. You know, that, yeah. that's, yeah. Uh, so you learn very quickly that the, the way you recognize things obviously is through, you know, the, the incision type of wound, you know, through the, uh, the blankets or if there's clothing or anything like that, sure. that, that can really tell you a lot of information, but the skin in of itself, because it's so flexible, will Correct. maybe, maybe, or maybe not tell you information. And that's why the blood stain analysis, which you're an expert at, is so critical to understand because the body, and you mentioned it, arterial, for an example, that looks different than, you know, somebody asphyxiating. And Correct. this kind of gives you, gives us an idea on, you know, what the right observations are here. And it also gives an investigator what they are looking for. I am. Um, one of my last cases before um, I retired, it was a, a guy, a tweaker, and you know, and we used to say the knife went on full auto uh, because <clears throat> I was there with the ME and we were counting wounds to cast off, wounds to cast off, and we were trying. He was trying to systematically, you know, figure out, you know, where this was going to go, and so I think in this particular case. Uh, the brutality of four individuals, uh, that knife potentially, do you, do you believe that there could be transfer obviously from the knife, uh, from one victim to the next in terms of blood, um, you know, from victim to victim? Uh, of course, of course, there's always that issue with cross-contamination, especially when you've got just one weapon. And so, um, but, but the DNA analysis oftentimes can separate mixtures. And so um, even though there might be multiple victims, sometimes the DNA can separate mixtures. Um, in this particular situation, it was, a, it was obviously a very brutal situation and um, multiple types of wounds. Uh, you know, the, there was uh, arterial, some arterial breach. There was some uh, dripping, which means that the um, the blood dripped off of a knife. So that's going to be a little different. Uh, you've got cast off that may be cast off off of the weapon um, on along side of a wall or a ceiling. So all of those kinds of stains you're probably going to see in in a situation like this. Ex explain that how you how you can tell the difference between the dripping. I talk about 90 degree uh, drop. Okay. Okay. A 90 degree drop is basically, it just means that the, the, there's blood on a surface, perhaps um, in this particular incidence, it was a knife and blood has accumulated on this, on the knife. And basically it just means that um, as a person is walking through the scene Sometimes you can have a dripping that drips off of a knife based on nothing but gravity pulling on it, and you'll get a very circular stain. Um, depending on this type of surface it hits, um, it could hit a very smooth surface and you will have a very round drop. If it hits a very corrugated surface or a very unsmooth surface, um, something that has some grain in it, you may find a very a drop that may have some scalloping or spatters along the edge of it. So the drops, um, any any kind of a scene may have multiple types of uh, blood stains, even though they're just the same kind of event even though if it's just gravity pulling on it, a lot has to do with what kind of surface that it's hitting. And so um, you, you have to be able to look at those things and know that um, what, what kind of a surface you're dealing with, what kind of force you're dealing with to be able to kind of tell the story behind it. Yeah, so I know people are, uh, there's one, person asking what have we learned from this 
Um, I don't know. That's up to you. You're the listener. If you haven't learned anything, then, uh, you know, good luck with that. Uh, maybe this isn't your channel. <laughs> so <laughs> keep, keep moving. Uh, keep moving, Juniper. Uh, okay, that, that said, uh, let's talk about why uh, the testing is important, and maybe we can teach uh, Juniper Rob something here. Uh, talk about amino black and uh, why that uh, is applied to enhance latent uh, prints and uh, that type of stuff. Okay. Le uh, amino black is a protein stain. And basically what it does is it reacts to the proteins that are present in the blood. And what happens is if um, someone is, let's just say, for example, someone has blood on their shoe. And they walk through, walk through an area, and that blood is transferred onto, say, like a piece of tile or linoleum or concrete. This amido black, being the protein stain that it is, can be applied to an area, and um, it turns kind of a blue-black color when it reacts to the proteins in the blood. And so that's very important because in and with especially using amido black, which is a very good enhancement stain, there are very good individual characteristics that can be found. So, for example, if someone walks through blood and then walks along a tile floor or along concrete, you can use amido black to find certain individual characteristics that might be present in their shoe impressions. I've even had crime scenes where bare feet were walking and they were they had stepped in blood and then when they walked on the linoleum or the concrete we were able to get footprints not foot not shoe impressions but we were able to actually get uh, footprints which are individualized to every person so no people two people have the same individual uh, footprints just like they don't in handprints or shoe, uh, fingerprints. So those are very, very important items to have. Amido Black is a very, very good enhancement chemical. It can help enhance very small details. Sometimes then we can take that information that we have found off of that impression and compare it to a shoe and identify it right back to this person who was wearing the shoe. So that footprint uh, or the shoe print found outside of one of the uh, surviving uh, victims, mm -hmm. um, that's significant. The amino black, why, why, why use that instead of luminol? Okay, luminol is typically used for cleanup. So in the event that you walk into a crime scene and it's not a very bloody crime scene that you can see, but that you can tell that there's been some kind of a cleanup of the scene. That's when luminol is the best. There's also a luminol derivative called Blue Star. Both of those are very good for areas that have been cleaned up. There are, uh, and they're not great for individual characteristics. Now let me explain what an individual characteristic is. An individual characteristic in your handprint might be a ridge or an ending ridge or um, maybe a, a very small individual thing that's uh, maybe a dot that's in your fingers or on your palm or your fingerprints, a whirl um, or a loop. But the um, in a shoe print or a footwear impression, these individual characteristics may be a nick in your shoe. Maybe you've got a rock in your shoe that's been embedded into the tread and it's caused a cut. Um, you, you'd be surprised if you look at the bottom of your shoes, how they wear differently, even from one foot to the other. You'll get individual shoes, very um, individual characteristics. Sometimes you get tiny little rocks that are embedded in between the, um, the treads, the wear pattern on your shoe. You can get little cuts based on the fact that maybe you stepped on a rock and you got a little individual cut there. All of those items, all those individual characteristics can be used to identify it back to a particular shoe impression. So what we do with Amido Black, which is a better choice 
for footwear impressions than say like LCV on a floor. Now, LCV is another kind of an enhancement chemical. It's called leucocrystal violet. It's great for footwear impressions, say like on carpet or something that's very porous. But Amido Black is great for, it's a protein stain. It's great for looking at shoes, the very individual characteristics of shoes, like those nicks and cuts that I was telling you about. You can actually identify them back to a particular shoe. And so that's very important when you have a situation where you can actually recover a bloody shoe print or a footprint in a scene. So talk about quality assurance in regards uh, to crime scenes. What exactly does that mean? Okay. Quality insurance is very, very important. Um, we live and die by quality insurance assurance. We want to make sure that number one, our product or our, our crime scene product uh, report is going to be accurate. We want to make sure that um, when we deliver a report, it is as accurate as it can possibly be. And so quality assurance is when, let me give you an example. Say for example, you're using a particular kind of chemical process or reagent to process a scene. Let's just talk about that shoe impression you were talking about just now and the amido black that was potentially used. We want to use, we want to make sure that that amido black is working properly. So we do what we call, well, first of all, before we even take it out of the laboratory, we test it. We want to make sure that it comes from the laboratory. It's been tested. Um, the quality assurance is good. We want to make sure that all the chemicals that we've used making that particular product are good. And so we use, we use the uh, Amido Black or whatever reagent that we're going to use. We're going to test it before we use it. We, put we use it on like a control area and um, we want to make sure that it's okay. So that's what we call um, quality assurance. We want to make sure that our product is working as well as it possibly can work. And so what we do before we even use our reagents at a scene, we will test it on a control sample, making sure that it actually is going to work in the way that we need it to work. And so all of our reagents, you can actually buy reagents that are pre -pre uh, already prepared, but a lot of times in a laboratory setting, we make our own reagents just to, um, it actually is saves money. And sometimes it's even a better quality than prepared uh, reagents. But we want to make sure that they are done 100% properly. We test them before we use them and make sure that the quality is exactly what we want. That's why you're here. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, she could go on for days. I could. And days. You know, I, I've, she, she teaches this stuff to law enforcement, and, and I've seen her in the classroom. So, uh, I mean, you know, and with some of the other things that we've done in the, with the Cold Case Foundation. Okay, uh, guys and gals, start, uh, you know, hammering up some questions here for uh, Karen. I've already had her an hour and 15 minutes, so I, I want to make sure she can get back to her family too. But so while we're waiting for a couple of these questions to come in, um, do you think any of the evidence based on what you've seen so far, and of course, you know, this is kind of an open-ended question, but um, it sounds like they've, they've, they did a whole bunch here, a lot. Um, is there anything that you think you would have um, want, that you would want to know uh, about what they've done so far that would solidify they got the right guy? Well, you know, it's interesting because this particular case, they've been very closed mouth about it. They've done, put some gag orders on it. They've tried to make sure that there's a lot of information that we don't know. Um, as far as the crime scene analysis and blood stain pattern, I have not seen a ton of that, um, but I really, um, I'm, I'm very, very careful 
about um, making judgments if I don't have all of the information. Uh, as far as I can tell, Idaho State Police have done a very, very good job taking care of, of this information. So I'm, I'm hoping that, uh, that we have as much information as we can to get a good Yeah, no, I think condition. it's a great answer. Yeah. And I see one question. It's, do, uh, it's to me, uh, do you think he got a lift in another car? You know, I... I don't know that I, it sounds like they have his car on video uh, yeah. on that street. So um, I think that's a tough one. Yeah. Uh, this one here is Karen. Uh, why did the Emmy do you think went in the house five hours later? Um, the medical examiner's reporting or their, their collection of evidence is very, very methodical. OK, the um, medical examiner, once the body, once, once there's the body there, the medical examiner um, will typically take their time and do a really comprehensive photography and collection of any kind of evidence that might be pertinent to their particular questioning. And so. Um, the five hours really doesn't surprise me if that's factual. I don't know that I've heard that, but if it's factual, there's a lot of times, many, many times, the crime scene units will have to go in first and then they have to work around the body sometimes because the body's actually part of the crime scene. And we want to make sure that we're not contaminating any evidence that could potentially take away from um, good forensic analysis. So if you've got multiple footwear impressions on the way to the body in the house, you'll want to collect all of that information before you get to the body because you don't want to cross contaminate things. And let me just say this many, many times medical ambulances will arrive early and sometimes they can't help but destroy or cross-contaminate evidence. That's just the nature of the business. You want to make sure that your victim, if potentially they could still be alive, they are alive. And so you want to make sure you get to them first. In situations like that, we may lose evidence because medical is the most important. We want to make sure that the victim's taken care of. But if we know that the victim is dead, we want to do a methodical search and we do it from the outside in, making sure that all the evidence is collected from the outside into it so that we don't cross contaminate anything. That is a very great answer. So I'm going to answer this one. Uh, did you give the LE the glove you found? Uh, well, first of all, I didn't ever touch that item that I saw, and I pointed it out. What they did with that, we're going to have to wait to see. That is a very interesting question. Uh, here's one. If they demolished the house, could it hinder the case? Um, you know, if, What do you think, Karen? Um, I think they... Um there's a great chance that there's enough evidence that's been retrieved. There's enough um, information that's been taken out by the crime scene units, all of the videos, all of the documentation of the scenes. I think there's a great possibility that there's enough information there so that when you go to court, there's that information that has been collected documented thoroughly with photography, with video, so that basically they could reproduce that particular scene if necessary. I've been to many scenes where we've had to um, uh, not demolish, but we, we weren't able to get back to that scene. So we had to recreate it. Now, I wouldn't say that they would recreate the entire house, but 
I, I think if there's enough good documentation, it would be okay. Now, I, my understanding, and this is what I've heard just recently, my understanding is that they are going to keep the house a little longer so that in the event that if it goes to trial, they may be able to go back through it. The jurors may go through it. I don't know if that's still true. I have not heard anything recently, but I think that's a very, very important key piece of information for the jurors to see. Because if you can put yourself into the scene, it makes more sense. A drawing or a photograph just doesn't always get it. Um, if you can walk somebody back through it, it can actually put them there and it makes them feel like they were actually there. Okay, and Adrian asked, uh, how long does it take to become a forensic investigator? Still feel there's also another person or three, okay? Um, all right. Okay. Well, the first part is yours. The first part, how long does it take to become a forensic investigator? That de is determined about what kind of an investigation you want to get into. Um, there are some degrees that are associate degrees that will just get you like a very um, simplified crime scene type of a associates type of a degree. My recommendation is that you go forth and get a four-year degree minimal. And the reason for that is you get the science background. You get the um, forensic information, the good forensic background. You get the medical, lead, a medical legal background, which is like um, information from like an invest, uh, uh, medical examiner investigation. Um, you get chemistry, you get, uh, so for example, you go and collect uh, something at a meth lab, you have the knowledge to know how to walk into that scene and know how to protect yourself or know what you're looking for. So I think it's really good to get a four-year degree, minimal, um, a lot of times people, depending on the area of expertise they want to go into, like if they want to go into chemical analysis, say, for example, controlled substances and stuff, you want to get a chemistry degree. If you want to go into um, uh, blood stain analysis or DNA, stuff like that, you might want to get a biology degree. Um, there's also different avenues that can get you a crime scene uh, in a crime scene direction. So it depends on the avenue that you want to take. Different areas of expertise may take certain length of time. I have a master's degree. Um, that means that I went through a four-year uh, college, and then I ended up going through basically two more years. Um, and getting uh, a master's degree so that I can become a little bit more specialized. And as you can tell everybody, uh, you are hearing the fruits of that uh, this evening. And I see, here's a comment from Ryden, the house will be demolished, the college is putting a memorial on campus. Yeah, and and I, I think at some point that would be a wise idea mm -hmm. to demolish the house. Yes. Um, but I also agree that, in my opinion, they should leave it until the jury or at least it's been determined in the court from both the prosecution and the defense that the defense signs off that we don't need that house. Correct. And because they went in right after uh, the crime uh, into that house. And so... It's as much as a decision now that he's in custody for the defense as it is for the prosecution. Yes. So that that uh, that would be made uh, jointly, and then of course, yeah, tear it down. That it doesn't need to be there yeah. anymore at the at the conclusion of this, and uh, whatever whatever the court and uh, justice takes. Okay, 
I got to tell you something, Karen. Your husband married so far up, he can't see straight. That is so <laughs> obvious. You're kind. <laughs> that is so obvious. I, uh, I am just delighted that you came here this evening uh, and spent some time away from your family. Uh, we are so grateful here uh, on the interview room. And I, and I also know that uh, just Greg and Dean and everybody and your work there at the Cold Case Foundation is just you know, just so well, so much appreciated. And you've done so many great things. Now, well, here's thank you. It has been my pleasure. And it's an honor to be on the Cold Case Foundation. Well, I'll tell you, here's the good news. You get the last word. I'm going to get out of the scene here. You get to talk to the audience one on one. There's about, you know, there's a lot of folks here, about 2,500 okay. people here watching you. And you can just tell them whatever you want to say. And then at the end of that, we go to Hawaii as a tradition here, and you'll see okay. what I mean here, here in a moment. Okay. So, Karen Elliott, thank you so much for being a, uh, a guest here on the interview room, and uh, it's all yours. Okay. Well, guys, the only thing I can tell you is this has been, um, my career has been an absolute joy to me. It is um, it is, is a passion that I had. I, worked my entire life for. I love being able to help, um, but I enjoy the science portion of it as well. I um, think that um, it's very, very um, interesting. It's very unique. Um, but more than anything, that we can be a part of something big and better, and we can actually give these victims who are, are are already in such a sad situation, we can give them some closure. And so I think it's so important to um, to do what you love. My passion has always been uh, law enforcement and forensics. I love it. Um, I went to school for it. And it has been an absolute joy in my life to be able to know that I can help people um, get closure to situations like this. This has been a terrible, terrible case that um, uh, we just hope that they're, that these people can get some closure at the end. And that it's a pleasure for me to be able to be a part of this. Hard working every day, I'm stressed out 24-7, babe, no, no timeouts Wish we could fly away, you and I Go to our favorite place, oh yeah, yeah Make special memories, together I'll be your company, now and forever Facing away Facing away.